Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you with me. Uh, my name is Justin Benoit. I'm an emergency physician here at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, some of you may know me. I've been around Cincinnati for a while. I'm the medical director for Delhi Fire. I'm also a flight physician with Air Care and a tactical physician with the Cincinnati SWAT team. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for being with me. Let's do this. So uh, today we're going to be talking about a little bit of a different topic. We're going to be talking about when can we stop delivering medical care. You know, usually we're always talking about what are we going to do with this patient? How are we going to manage them? How are we going to try to save them? Uh, but today we're actually going to talk about when are we allowed to stop providing medical care? And there's actually a number of different places where the protocol talks about this, but I'm going to try to bring them all together so you get a comprehensive picture of what that looks like. So let's go. So we're going to go over kind of, uh, I guess, five big topics here. Um, and this is kind of the five big areas where we are allowed to stop. Uh, the first one is what I like to call when the patient is dead dead. You know, we take care of a lot of patients who are, quote, dead, but they're not quite dead yet, i.e. patients who are in cardiac arrest, and in fact, we bring them back. But when is the patient really dead dead, and we don't even need to begin to do anything? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about refusals. This is always a complicated issue. It's an issue that, you know, makes people very nervous, documentation, getting signatures. Uh, so I want to provide a little bit of a framework there to help you with refusals. We're going to talk some about termination of resuscitation rules. So where we started doing something, we provided a lot of medical care, but now we've determined there's no reason to keep going and we're going to stop. There's both a medical and a trauma version of that. We're going to talk about do not resuscitate orders, also another uh, a critical thing that sometimes can be confusing. There's paperwork, there's signatures, is this okay? We want to talk about that. And lastly, we're going to talk about a very unique protocol, uh, the diabetic treat and release protocol, which is really the only place in the protocol that specifically kind of says, you know, hey, we can just let the patient kind of, you know, go on their way here. Uh, we've done what needs to be done. So with that, let's get into it. All right, so we're going to start with, again, what I like to call dead dead. When is the patient so dead that we really just don't need to do anything? And probably most people are familiar with these. Um, the first, there's kind of two categories when I think about it. The first category is injuries incompatible with life. Okay, so obviously here we're talking about trauma patients. And when we get to that trauma patient, when are we just allowed to say, you know, frankly, you know, I'm sorry, this patient is just dead, dead. There's nothing to be done. And I've listed the big ones here, okay? Decapitation, fancy word for the patient's head has been severed from their body. Uh, that is not compatible with life. There's no way to bring that patient back. Hemicorpectomy is a fancy way for saying uh, basically they've been cut in half, okay? If half their body is on one side of the street and, you know, the other half is on another side of the street, that is unfortunately uh, not compatible with life. Obviously not a scenario we want to uh, imagine, but, uh, you know, it does occasionally happen. That is not compatible with life, uh, therefore we don't need to do anything. Incineration is another one. Now, we obviously want to be careful here. That doesn't just mean third degree burns. I'm talking about incinerated, right? Where it is just, you know, truly the body is charred. Uh, you know, probably 100% of the body is, is severely burned. This is even beyond third degree burns, right? Uh, it was a house fire. Maybe, you know, somebody did not get out uh, and we get called for some reason, or maybe we're already on scene and the body is just burned beyond recognition. Uh, you don't need to do anything. Um, and finally, a severe crush injury. Again, I, I'm going to stress the word severe here. It's not just any crush, but I'm talking about, you know, an entire building has collapsed on someone by the time, you know, we we get to them, their body is just truly, uh, you know, flattened or something like that, um, or, you know, the head has completely crushed in or something. Again, I, I know these are terrible things to talk about, um, but, uh, you know, in that case, these are all injuries incompatible with life. The one that I will caution you about that you will notice is not on this list is a gunshot wound to the head. I've gotten that question a number of times over the years, and we got to be careful there because, you know, if it's a shotgun to the head and the head is, you know, essentially missing, okay, you know, that kind of falls along the lines of decapitation or something like that. But just because there is a bullet wound to the head does not mean that is incompatible with life. In fact, there are plenty of people who are still living here in Cincinnati who have suffered a gunshot wound to the head. It may not penetrate very far into the skull. It may not hit a critical portion of the brain. You know, believe it or not, you can uh, survive that. Um, 
So I would caution you about gunshot wound to the head. Uh, that in and of itself, I would say, is not a category of being dead dead. So that's the first group, injuries incompatible with life. The other category of patients who are dead dead is that they are showing us signs that they are dead. Um, and so this could be someone who is not a trauma patient, could be, you know, they had a cardiac arrest, a medical cardiac arrest in the middle of the night, and, you know, maybe the family wakes up and discovers the patient, and they call 911, right, and we get there, and there is evidence that this patient has been dead for an extended period of time, okay? And the classic ones there are rigor mortis, okay? That means that the body stiffens. If you've never seen it before, it's very noticeable. Uh, you know, the limbs are almost like frozen, like you can't move the arms and the legs they're just like locked in place that usually happens a couple of hours after death um, it's not right away so um, but a number of hours later so if you see that it's obvious that the body has been dead for multiple hours there's no reason to move forward dependent lividity basically means that there's a pooling of blood um, in the body. Usually this shows up as you kind of see this odd bruising pattern that's only in the dependent areas of the body. So if the body was on, say, its back, you're going to find this pooling of blood, this bruising on their back, their flank, their back area, maybe the buttocks or the shoulders, the back of the shoulders, something like that. So if you see that pooling of blood, that dependent lividity, that also, that tends to kick in a little bit sooner than rigor mortis. Again, that would be a sign that the patient has unfortunately been dead for an extended period of time. We don't need to do anything. Um, and finally, decomposition, probably pretty obvious. Obviously, that's something that's going to develop days later, um, not right away. Um, but again, if you see evidence of decay on the body, uh, that is evidence that the patient has been dead for probably multiple days. And so again, there is nothing we need to do. So in all of these scenarios, this is in the protocol. These are patients, again, that I call dead dead. Um, there is nothing to be done. No medical care should be started on these patients. The patient is basically already dead, and we got there, and we're just sort of, you know, giving our uh, medical opinion that, uh, you know, based on the protocol, we don't need to do anything. All right, so hope that's uh, clear. Let's move on to the next category. The next category is refusals. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think this is the most confusing of all the topics. So I'm going to spend a good amount of time on this, all right? And for the next ones, let me give you a little bit of a case maybe to get your mind thinking. So, you know, this is a, a real patient that I had a number of years ago in the emergency department. It was a 50-year-old um, lady who uh, had been struck uh, by a car. She was walking across the street and basically a car had hit her in her legs. It uh, did not run her over, but the bumper had hit her very hard, sort of right around the knee area. Okay. She came into the emergency department. She was having a lot of pain in her legs. Her legs were obviously deformed. Uh, we got x-rays of them, and she had what's called a uh, tibial plateau fracture, which is a bad fracture, sort of of the, the part of the tibia that uh, is essentially in the knee. Very bad injury, definitely needs surgical repair by an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and so, you know, we started to tell her this, and she just started to say, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. And, you know, I, I kept talking to her and I said, well, ma'am, you know, you have this bad fracture. Uh, you know, we need to get this repaired. Otherwise, you'll, you'll never be able to walk again. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. She just kind of said the same thing over and over and over again. And the more I talked to her, the more I sort of got the sense that she probably had a psychiatric history, which I later confirmed she had a, a known history of schizophrenia. And, um, and just never really said anything to me other than, I just want to go home. That's all she, she ever said. Just literally never said anything else. So let's imagine this scenario. Maybe it wasn't in the emergency department. Let's say we were out on the street and this happened. Do you let this lady refuse? Do you say, okay, well, sign here, ma'am. You know, uh, good luck uh, not walking. Uh, you know, are, are, should we do that? Uh, that's the question that I'm posing to you. So how do we figure this out? How do we determine if we should let that patient refuse or not? Because that's what this issue is really all about. Should we allow that patient to refuse, okay? So to understand this, we need to understand two terms, capacity and competency, all right? And what we assess as providers on scene, and you have the power to assess this, is capacity. Because someone has to have capacity in order for us to allow them to refuse, okay? And what capacity means is that they have the you know mental wherewithal, they know what's going on, um, to be allowed to make medical decisions. 
And if a patient does not have capacity, they are not allowed to make medical decisions and they are therefore not allowed to refuse. Sometimes you will hear the word competency get thrown out there. It's similar, but a little bit different. Competency is actually something that's decided by the courts. And so somebody can be declared incompetent. And usually when that happens, immediately there is also someone who is then uh, designated by the courts to be the person who's going to make decisions for that person moving forward. Competency, you know, essentially is continuous until there is a new court order or something like that. Whereas capacity can change very quickly. Capacity can be different one second to the next. It can change so fast. And we're going to talk about that more in a second because maybe some of you are already thinking about some of these meshy issues with Narcan and heroin overdoses, and yes, this does matter. Okay, but before we get to that, let's think about capacity a little bit more. What does it mean to assess capacity, okay? The biggest thing I want you to take home is that capacity is not awake and alert and oriented times three, okay? Capacity is not GCS 15. That's not enough. It has to be more than that. So it's not just that they're awake and alert. They have to demonstrate more. And I've shown it to you right here on the slide, okay? To assess capacity, this is what we need to do. First of all, as a baseline, they have to have no signs of intoxication or any sort of altered mental status, okay? If the patient is intoxicated by any substance or, you know, they are confused or, you know, they, they're, they're very ill and that's why they're now having altered mental status, okay, we can't even really begin, okay? That's kind of that GCS 15, awake and alert and oriented times four, whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's step one, but we have to do more than that to assess capacity, okay? We need to demonstrate that the person understands the situation. So to go back to our example, ma'am, you know, tell me what happened today. Do, do you understand, you know, what happened, why your legs are hurting right now? The patient has to be able to describe that to you. They have to be able to say, yeah, I got hit by a car. You know, my legs were hit by the bumper. I have a knee fracture on both knees, uh, something like that, right? They have to demonstrate that they understand the situation. Then they have to demonstrate that they understand the various options available to them now that this has occurred. So, you know, uh, yes, I understand that, you know, you want to bring me into the hospital and, uh, you know, potentially have an orthopedic surgeon do surgery on me. Uh, you know, the other option would be, you know, we try to do this without surgery and we do splints and braces. You know, maybe a third option would be I just go home and I'm probably never going to be able to walk again. Okay. They have to be able to, to, to articulate all these various options. All right. And then they need to be able to articulate the risks and benefits of each of those options, right? So p potentially the risks of surgery, you know, the not risks of surgery, you know, what if we don't do anything, you know, you're never going to walk again, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then finally, they should be able to communicate a consistent choice. And in theory, it's supposed to be consistent with their sort of, you know, moral framework, but you won't really know that because you will have just met them. But in theory, it should be sort of consistent with who they are as a person, and they should probably be able to provide some sort of reason, um, you know, that, uh, uh, that they're going to choose this, you know, particular uh, choice or something like that. So anybody who you are trying to assess capacity for, they need to be able to show you all of these different things. If they can't demonstrate these things, they do not have capacity, and therefore, you are not allowed to let them refuse. You actually have to, um, you actually have to, you know, provide medical care that you normally would. Now, the intoxication uh, and the altered mental status thing often will, uh, will confuse people, especially when we start thinking about, you know, alcohol, we start thinking about heroin overdose, something like that. Now, these get to be messy situations, okay? Um, but, you know, if somebody, for example, did a heroin overdose, and now we have provided them Narcan, and now they are fully awake, right? The Narcan has taken away the effect of that opioid, so now they are not demonstrating any signs of intoxication or altered mental status. And if they can provide all of these things, then they are demonstrating to you that they have capacity, okay? And now, this is messy, though. This is difficult. 
and you might get that there is a lot of subjectivity in here. Ultimately, it's up to you. This is the power is actually in your hands to say, does this patient have capacity? Now, if you are concerned, yeah, I don't know, they still seem kind of sleepy, they're not fully with it, I'm not convinced they have capacity yet, well, that's fine. That is definitely your call, and then you say they do not have capacity, therefore they do not have the right to refuse, and so therefore we're going to take you to the hospital or something like that. Okay, you can imagine similar situations with alcohol. You know, okay, so say somebody goes into a bar, they have literally one sip of beer, and then something happens. Well, because they had one sip of beer, are they intoxicated now? When does intoxication begin? Is it after one beer? Is it after two beers? Is it after three beers, right? There's no rule here. It's still subjective, but it is your assessment of are they showing signs of intoxicated ultramental status? Can they answer these questions? Okay, if they can, you know, or like, you know, if they're not showing signs of intoxication, they can answer these questions uh, appropriately, you know, then you would be, it would be reasonable to say, you know, that the patient has capacity and they can refuse. But again, if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't think they have capacity, that is your call to make. The point here is, is the final little bullet point I have, is that this is a sliding scale, okay? Capacity, the assessment of capacity, it, it's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. It can be different one minute to the next. And so there's no, there's no hard line in the sand here. So we have to use judgment. We have to use our best assessment of the patient to decide, uh, you know, do they have capacity or not? Similarly, I would put the bar of capacity higher or lower depending on how serious it is uh, of what they want to refuse. You know, if it's a minor traffic accident, you know, everybody was seat belted, it was low speed, everybody looks fine, you're kind of under the impression that, you know, no one's injured and people just want to refuse, that's probably fine because you're saying, eh, you know, I can set the bar here a little bit lower, right? But if you're really worried, if you are really worried, then you should set that bar very high, very high. And maybe it becomes so high that just, you know, you're going to say, no, nobody, you know, you just do not have enough capacity to refuse this. Um, and, and so, you know, therefore we're going to move forward, okay? So I just want you to think about that again. When we're talking about refusals, it's all about assessing capacity. And if and only if the patient demonstrates to you that they have capacity, can you then allow them to refuse, all right? And that's the way that, that I want you to think about it. A few other notes on refusals. You know, when, when possible, try to find a compromise. Sometimes that patient who initially starts saying no to you Maybe they just don't like something in particular. Uh, maybe they just don't want an IV. Maybe they're scared of needles. Maybe they don't want that shot or something like that. Um, but if you just talk to them and you say, well, look, all right, you know, I'm supposed to get an IV on you, but you know, if, if, we, if I allow you to like, not get an IV right now, will you still come with me to the hospital? And maybe that patient will say yes. All right, and that's reasonable, okay? So try to find a compromise. It's not an all or nothing thing. If, uh, if you can find some compromise where maybe it's not exactly what you wanna do, but it's pretty close and it gets the patient to the hospital or whatever, and you think it's in the best interest of the patient, that's fine, all right? We also run into situations a lot about, um, uh, about sort of, well, what about somebody who, um, you know, just doesn't even want to see you, you know, they don't want to, uh, uh, they don't even want to talk to you. Um, they're just like totally not interested in, uh, uh, in engaging with you right now or something like that, okay? When you have that kind of a situation, you just want to assess what you can, all right? If they're not letting you talk to them, if they're not letting you ask all those questions that you want to ask, that can be frustrating. Assess what you can. Try to get a sense of those capacity questions as best as you can, all right? Uh, examine them to the extent they will allow you um, and just do what you can, all right? 
keep in mind that patients are allowed to change their mind, right? So just because someone, you know, refuses medical care and signs the paperwork, and then all of a sudden they say, nah, you know what, I want to go. Or maybe some family member comes in and, what are you talking about? The paramedics are saying, you got to go to the hospital. You're crazy. What are you doing? You got to go. You know, and then the patient, you know, kind of changes their mind and, and says, all right, all right, I'll go to the hospital or something like that, right? Uh, you got to let them do that. Let, it's okay if they can, if they change their mind. Again, don't make it a brick wall. No, you already signed the form. We're out of here. Peace. Uh, you know, we, we need to kind of let them change their mind, okay? And, and finally, and probably most important, is you got to document, 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 okay? That is really critical um, for these refusals um, because that's really what's going to protect you, okay? Uh, everybody wants to get that signature. You know, they get that refusal sheet, and they say, okay, you know, here's the sheet, you know, sign here. All right, we're done. Um, but... I'll tell you, what's really going to protect you is not the signature on the piece of paper. It's really your documentation, all right? And so for these charts, these are the charts where your narrative should be long, not short, okay? It's not, oh, arrived on scene, you know, patient was fine, patient signed refusal paperwork, we left the scene, whatever, right? No, right? This is where the narrative needs to be long, okay? And what are you going to put in that narrative? all the stuff we just talked about. In fact, here, we'll just, we'll go back and we'll take another look at it, right? We're going to talk about these things. We're going to say, I assessed capacity in this patient. And you're going to use that word in your chart. You're going to use the word capacity. Write it into the chart. I assessed capacity in this patient. And in my assessment of capacity, I found that the patient had no signs of intoxication or altered mental status at the time of my assessment. Okay? They understood the situation, which was blank. They understood their options, which was this, that, the other thing. They understood the risks of these various choices, which are this, this, and this. And ultimately, after this long conversation, the patient communicated this choice for this reason. Given the fact that the patient has capacity, I therefore allowed them to refuse, okay? That is what's gonna protect you. Now, I know some of you are already like, oh man, that's a lot to write down, but I'm telling you, I do the same thing, okay? When I'm in the emergency department and I have, you know, somebody signs out against medical advice, do you think my chart is short or long? It's long, it's very long, okay? So this is the one to take the time. Don't spend all your time getting a signature and then document nothing, do it the other way around. You know, still get the signature, but we wanna spend time documenting totally critical. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Refusals, always stressful. Um, hopefully that will give you a framework uh, moving forward when you encounter a situation like this in the future. All right. Um, oh, yes, I forgot. Oh, I got even more for you. There's even more on refusals. So let's get even more messy with refusals. Um, here are some even stickier situations, okay? And actually, I kind of started to allude to this before of who is a patient, all right? Because sometimes this plays into whether or not you even technically need a refusal, all right? So let's go back, let's think about another one. Um, let's say it's a third party call, all right? This happens not infrequently. Uh, there's, you know, some car accident on the side of the road, um, but, you know, maybe it's just a little fender bender and, you know, some passerby or some other driver calls EMS, calls 911 saying, hey, there's been an accident, you know, so we get called and we show up and there's this fender bender and maybe there's four patients in the car or something like that, okay? Um, you know, and, uh, and they're all like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want any medical care. Someone else called. I never would have called 911. What do you do now? Okay, what do you do in that situation? All right, so the protocol actually does talk about this some, and, and what some of this comes down to is who is a patient? All right, now, I'm going to read you this. I, I got it here. Quote from the protocol, okay, quote, a patient is any person who identified him or herself as requiring medical condition from, or sorry, medical care from an illness or an injury, okay? So by the protocol, that person where there's a third party call, you show up, you get there, and, and the supposed patient is saying, I don't want call, I don't want care, I didn't call, somebody else called, okay? In some respects, you can make an argument and say, that person is not actually a patient by the protocol, and so therefore we don't need to do anything. Now, I recognize the fact that that's still messy, 
A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people will probably still get some sort of signature on that person, and I get it, and that's fine. And if that's what you need to do, I think that's very reasonable. What should you do in that situation? All the things we just talked about, right? And if the person's like, hey, man, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I really don't want to, don't put the blood pressure cuff on me. I'm fine. Again, right, it's like we talked about before. Then just assess what you can. Get w what information you can. Have them answer a few questions if you can. Assess what you can. And then document, 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 right? Just in case, in case something happens later on, you've documented that you did do an assessment for, you know, what the patient would allow me to do was A, B, C, and based on that, I assessed my capacity, or I assessed their capacity, and, you know, this was my finding, and so therefore I let them refuse, okay? So you can think about it either way. I don't have a strong feeling on whether or not you should just say, hey, the protocol says that's not a patient, or if you should still get a, you know, refusal from them, but those are my thoughts on, uh, on how to deal with that situation, all right? Pediatrics uh, is tricky, okay? Because a pediatric patient, technically, because legally, they haven't been, you know, they're not uh, 18 yet, okay? Legally, they don't have the ability to make choices all the time, okay? And so that's really an issue of competency. Remember that word that we talked about before, not capacity? So they chronically do not have competency, okay? because legally, you know, they're under the age, so they're not allowed to make decisions, okay? The parents make decisions, right? So that means that that pediatric patient technically cannot refuse. So I would be very careful with the pediatric patients. That is, is to me, a, a, a difficult but dangerous situation. I would not allow a pediatric patient to refuse, okay? Now, if both parents are there, parents, you know, want to refuse the parents, can refuse, right? But then you're going to do the same assessment of capacity on the parents that you're going to do, that you would have done on the patient if they weren't a child, right? So if dad, you know, is there, but dad's drunk, okay? Does dad have capacity? Nope. Does the kid have competency or capacity? Nope, okay? So now you have to make the decisions, right? And as you probably know, right, when nobody is around to make the decision, then you have to make the decision. So be careful with pediatric patients, okay? A chronic lack of capacity, or again, someone who doesn't have competency, right? This would be someone who just, you know, maybe they have dementia, they're in a nursing home, you know, they never really are with it, okay? So keep in mind when that happens, right, as soon as someone lacks the ability to make a decision, then it starts going down the family chain in terms of who makes the decision next, right? So if they're married, it would be, you know, the spouse, okay? If they're, you know, if they're, if they're not married, um, you know, then it usually goes to like, I got to think about it, I think it'll go to like the parents next, then it would go to like, you know, uh, first uh, degree children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But it needs to start going down that order of family. That's who's allowed to make the decision when that patient does not have capacity. So you have to start thinking about those things. If the patient, you know, chronically doesn't have capacity, then you need to be thinking about that, um, that, uh, that order of who gets to make a decision next. What happens a lot of times is that nobody's there, right? There's no family member there. It's just you and, you know, the nurse at the nursing home or something like that. So then who makes the decision? You do, right? You, as the medical provider, because the patient doesn't have capacity, there's no family members around who can make decisions, right? So then you make the decision, and obviously you should just do whatever is in the best interest of the patient, all right? And finally, another really weird kind of scenario that comes up is these issues of phone refusals, okay? Somebody's calling in. Uh, the the one that's probably most, um, you know, most likely to happen would be the parents calling because of some sort of kid or something like that. Okay, uh, that's actually pretty clear. As far as I know, um, that is not allowed. Um, and, and I don't want to necessarily quote Ohio law, but uh, I'm pretty sure that that one's not allowed. So um, a pediatric patient, again, I don't think you can take a phone call from mom and dad, uh, mom and dad need to show up and provide a signature in person, okay? If we're talking about not a pediatric patient, um, but, you know, for some reason, maybe it's, a, you know, again, maybe it's, it's uh, the mom or dad, you know, who has dementia, they're in a nursing home, and now you're talking to the, you know, adult son and daughter via the phone, um, you know, that can be okay, 
Um, again, I would use your clinical judgment here. If you do that, the general recommendation is that you have two people independently talk to those family members on the phone and assess capacity and then document that, you know, paramedic A and paramedic B both independently talked to name of person, name of person, you know, who is the power of, you know, who has medical decision-making ability for this patient, and, uh, you know, we assess capacity and all the things we talked about before. I know you're probably sitting here right now saying, oh, man, this sounds like a pain. This sounds like a lot of work. Um, again, I, I would do it. Um, and we run into these situations in the emergency department sometimes, and yeah, we're making a lot of phone calls and we're doing a lot of work. Obviously, if it seems like it's gonna be that big of a pain, maybe it's just easier to not let the patient refuse, right? And just say, look, this is too messy. We can't do this. We gotta go to the hospital. We gotta take the patient now, you know, and then we'll let the emergency department figure it out. That's totally reasonable. All these details are if you're going to allow someone to refuse. All right, now I think that's the end of refusals. I told you that we were gonna spend a lot of time on that. It's a messy topic. All right, let's keep going. Hopefully that was useful.